it's also introductory. Um, so last time was sort of an introductory lecture. We talked a little bit about what the uh, structure of the, of the course is. And uh, hopefully you've got a, a, a good idea of maybe how that's all going to uh, transpire. As I said, there's a lot of things happening on in this course. You kind of need to use that schedule to keep everything uh, going. What I'd like to do today is to do another introductory talk but one that I think kind of puts a lot of things in perspective so we can kind of build on a lot of this material uh, you know, th throughout the year. So I'm going to uh, just kind of give you, a, a, again, a, a few example problems. I want, to, I want to take now three particular problems. Each of those is going to be associated with uh, well, a, a different kind of problem as well as a different physical property. And then we're going to use that to kind of talk about the geophysical data and the inversion and uh, just sort of see, see where we go. <coughs> so here, here's the first one. Uh, unexploded ordnance. Uh, there actually are, even in Canada, quite a few old proving grounds that uh, need to be uh, Need to be fixed up. This is an active source uh, region, but when the Canadian military or any military trains people, they've got to, you know, get them out onto some kind of a proving ground and you know provide them with uh, you know whatever tanks and munitions they have, right? So these guys might actually just be on sort of training training mission. They also use for those people who have hiked. Uh, they'll use uh, some kind of explosive to trigger an avalanche prior to it, uh, just so that they can kind of control it. So those are uh, potential uses of uh, no, unexploded or uh, ordnance items. And invariably only, uh, I mean, it's a relatively high fraction, but it's about maybe 90% of these things uh, explode. Uh, and if you can imagine, you remember when uh, you know the U.S. was bombing Afghanistan years ago, and they they do these carpet bombs and have all these little bomblets come, come down, right? Uh, you know, there's like millions of, of these, or if you go to Laos or Cambodia or places, you know, it, it just so many millions of explosives that have been dropped. And if, even if they bomb, oh, 90 percent of those exploded, that still leaves 10 percent, which is a huge number. And they can take a whole bunch of different shapes and forms and things, things like that. So you're ultimately trying to find these guys. And here's a site, actually, it's uh, our group here. We're in, in Montana. And there was an old proving ground. And so you're looking for this kind of stuff. But it's just all grass, right? So you have no way of, uh, of, of seeing anything. And uh, the thought of just digging randomly or completely uh, is uh, completely out of the question. So we're going to come back to that. Here's another one that's very germane to, to Canada. This is a Pontash mine. If you go into uh, basic, well, Saskatchewan especially, um, they've got under, underneath the ground uh, a large amount of uh, potassium salts. These things are about a kilometer beneath the surface. And they just mine these, these huge mines, and uh, they're always contending with their greatest nemesis, which is water. So you're a kilometer underground, and you've got all of these kind of you know, layered uh, earth above you, some aquifers, but you've also got places that there's there's a lot of water. And if you happen to hit one of these, uh, you can get a lot of water quickly. And some of the mines have been completely flooded, and uh, they have to close up. So water is a big issue. On the uh, mineral exploration side, uh, here's here's a typical example. Uh, this is a region in northern Quebec. It's called the Raglan Deposit. And here's the geologic map. And here is the geographic map. And you take a look at that, and it's like, Okay, you know, I got a deposit. Maybe it's uh, you know, hundred meters on, on the side, buried at five hundred meters depth. Uh, you know, 
where the heck is this thing, right? So that's kind of what you're up against as far as trying to, to get some idea about, uh, about what the nature of the problem is. You just can't see. So what would we really want, of course, from this? We kind of alluded to it yesterday. So here's the geologic map. And there are certain things that are happening. We've got some outcrops here, this fault coming in here, very distinct rocks here to, compared to there. And uh, what, you, what you'd actually like to do is to sort of figure out, okay, what's, uh, what's underneath that ground? And to do that, you're going to need to have some kind of a, uh, of a geophysical survey. So here's a characteristic plot that you're going to see a lot of. It's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a thread that you can always attach any of our particular surveys to. Because geophysics works like this. We first of all have to have some kind of, of a source. Uh, need, we need energy that we're going to put into the ground. So that's the first thing. So we get source, puts energy into the ground, and that energy propagates through the subsurface. And how it propagates or accumulates uh, depends upon these physical properties that are inside the Earth, and importantly, the contrast between you know, physical property of this rock versus the, the one next to it. So energy in, got some stuff that's, that's moving around here, and then that's going to give rise to a response, and we're going to measure those as data. So that's our, that's our ticket here. With source, puts energy in, how that energy propagates through kind of depends upon the physical properties, and then we're going to measure some data. From the point of view of geophysics, the sources uh, are, can be really widely varying. They, they could be on the ground. Lots of times we'll just be carrying you know, something that's on the ground, or maybe laying out some, some, some roofs. Uh, this is what's happening in this plot here. Actually, this was in, uh, in, in British Columbia, uh, Tailings Pond. Uh, we were looking to try to see if we could find something about uh, where the tailings were. And you've got a transmitter that's, you know, it's on somebody's uh, waistline, and so he's basically taking data. You know, it's got source on track. Uh, we could also have something that's flying. Uh, here's a helicopter, and here's a transmitter uh, in this in this bird here. So we could have something there, or we could actually have sources in in the ground as we would in that. Uh, experiment in plot action. Energy goes in, and how that energy interacts with the Earth depends upon the physical properties. The physical properties that we're really interested in are density, how, uh, you know, the mass, free and volume, magnetic susceptibility, telling us how easily something can get magnetized, Electrical conductivity, which tells us how easy it is for that material to pass current. Chargeability tells us how the material can basically act as a capacitor. Electrical permittivity tells us about polarization of material. And elastic moduli depends telling us about how uh, elastic waves propagate. So here's a bunch of different physical properties, and these are different physical properties than geologists would use to describe your rocks, right? You get a rock, you've got you know, hardness, you've got texture, you've got color, you've got... So those, I mean, that's a very valid way of describing something, but geophysicists have an entirely different suite of things that they use to describe things. And, and then what you're going to see is that, you know, by combining that geologic description with the geophysical description, you can actually uh, start to help understand your geologic problem that you're trying to work with. And then the, uh, the surveys and the data, uh, they can also be on the ground. So in this case, here's the, here's the recorder. So there's the transmitter, there's the receiver. Uh, in the case of this helicopter, uh, we've got also receivers that are in here. And actually, there's another receiver that's being pulled up on here. It's measured in the head of here. So everything is. Uh, you know, a source interacting with the Earth, and then 
some data that are acquired. So why does geophysics work like this and how, how is it that we've uh, come to kind of uh, uh, use geophysics to, to characterize bodies? And, and the idea is, is basically this. We've, we've got a whole bunch of different physical properties. And what the physical property was was dairy, right? So if, if, if I knew all your all the physical properties uh, about you and the distribution, I might actually, it would be like a fingerprint, right? And I, I'd say, ah, okay, well, there's, there's Eric, right? So that's, that, that's kind of the goal. So you, you, <coughs> our idea is that everything, I mean, whether it's this podium or table or chair, everything has got some distribution of those physical properties. If we could find that, then we've got a fingerprint and we can then identify what's there. So that's, that's our goal. So now let's think about that, and we'll go back to a couple of the problems that we did. So we had this unexploded ordinance. So you remember what they were? They were, uh, you, know, they're, you know, they're bombs. They're made out of, uh, of steel, right? and they are, could be iron. And the physical properties that are associated with that is electrical conductivity, and magnetic susceptibility. So iron can become like a become magnetized. So magnetic susceptibility. Uh, it's a metal, so it could conduct electricity pretty easily. So those. So our ideas here, like we think, oh, we got a UXO problem. The very first thing we think about is like, okay, what's the diagnostic physical properties? And in this case, we come up with these two. So that's the, that's the first important step because that's then going to guide us through you know, where we might go from there. But it's, it's always to try to find which physical properties are going to be diagnostic. When we talk about uh, water in that potash mine, water is an interesting substance because if you take very pure water, it's actually very resistive. It does not conduct electricity very easily. But if you put in a, a little bit of... Uh, salts or metals into that water it can become very conductive and in this potash mine since you've got salts so you've got potassium chloride uh, you get a little bit of dissolved salt and suddenly you've got a liquid that's very highly conductive and then uh, for that minerals example uh, we've got a whole host of things that could describe minerals that so very often they're Magnetically susceptible. So, for anybody who's for anybody who has done a magnetic or uh, a minerals deposit uh, exploration, if you've been looking for minerals, undoubtedly you would have done a magnetic survey. Uh, the mineral deposit could be electrically conductive, could be chargeable, could be dense. So, there's a whole range of physical properties here that might be associated with that mineral deposit. And different mineral deposits will have different uh, characteristics. OK, so we, let's go back to this UXO thing. So we decided it's, it, you know, it's, it's iron and steel, right? So it might be, it might be magnetic. So one of the ways of trying to, to find this is to go out with an instrument. This is called a magnetometer. And this is, uh, it's called an analog instrument. And that's because it, 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 it basically gives you sound information depending upon what the strength of the signal is. It doesn't actually give you numbers, right? But you take this instrument here, and now you're, uh, oh, you're trying to find these UXOs. And you know, these guys are, are not so big, right? So you, you kind of need to do a constant sweep over the whole region. And then you know, you're going to be hearing a tone in your ear. And at some point, the tone becomes very loud, and you say, ah, this could be something there. You reach in your back pocket, you stick in a flag, and you mark that spot. Because that's where there's potentially a UXO. That's OK. But then at the end of the day, you look back, and it's like, whoa, that's a lot of flags. And it's almost like you have to dig up the whole area. and. Actually, the thing that you need to be concerned about if you're digging unexploded ordinance is 
that they could actually explode. Now, if you hit them with a shovel, uh, you might be in trouble. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a problem. The other way of doing things is to do digital geophysics. And what you're seeing here is one of the ex-graduate students, one of Baron, and he's got a sequence of four magnetometers. And now instead of pushing back and forth like this, he's just sort of walking steadily like this, and he's collecting data from these four sensors. They're all digital. He could collect them, and he could plot them out, and you can make a map. And that's what this is. So this is a map of the magnetic data that was acquired through this digital instrumentation. And you can see the information content on that, right? It's, it's basically kind of this yellowish green in the background, but then you got all of these, you know, red blue things, right? Well, in the next week or two, you'll know when you see these, you're going to see one of those and you're going to say, oh, yeah, there's a dipole. There's a magnetic dipole. So it's the thing that's giving rise to that signature is just exactly the same as if you took one of your old school bar magnets and put it down in the earth and then measured the magnetic So you can see that, oh, there's quite a few places. And by looking at those signatures, you know where things are and, you know, maybe even how deep they might be or get some additional so that's, that's kind of how things work, right? So we, we've got a problem, unexploded ordinance. What's the physical property? Magnetic. What kind of survey do we need? Well, something that measures magnetic field. And we go out, we collect those data, plot them up, maybe do some processing, and arrive at some conclusions about where things might be and then go ahead and dig them up. So that is... You know, essentially, the way that we'll think about all of the different geophysical experiments and surveys as, as we go along here. Uh, perhaps an interesting anecdote to that. So this is, uh, again, up in the limestone hills. And you, you can see how challenging this terrain would be, right? There's, there's roofs, there's rocks. Uh, you know, you, you definitely need to have some kind of digital data over here that's going to help you figure out where to go because uh, otherwise that would just be you know, uh, it would be prohibitive you just wouldn't be able to reclaim that area so you find that then you uh dig it up and uh, you got a mortar have the uh yeah uh, every 76 uh, millimeter fuse i'm sure you can see that very easily but there's there's something up there but uh, just because you find something magnetic doesn't actually mean it's the thing that you're looking for. You could, it's an old kokanee beer can, right? It's uh, made up tin. It's got a magnetic signature. You know, the geophysics doesn't actually distinguish. You know, it, it found something that was magnetic, right? It could have been a bomb. It could have been something else. It's, it's a piece of fry, uh, fry standing for fragment, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of iron, and uh, this stuff is hugely magnetic. This is also, it's, it's sometimes called shrapnel, and, and it's, that's actually the stuff that, you know, if you ever get caught near a bomb, uh, that's the stuff that really gets you, because it just sort of explodes, it's flying through the air, it's twirling around, can just you know, sever, you know, particular part of your wrist or anything, and those things are really terrible. But in, in this particular case, we wouldn't care about those. We, we'd be happy to leave all of that stuff in the ground. So you, you can see that the problem might be you know, more complicated. In, in one case, you can, you can find all the magnetic stuff. Some of it is uh, really important. You need to dig it up. But you also want to distinguish or discriminate against things that you can leave in the ground and stuff that you need to uh, dig up. If we come back to the potash uh, mines, 
<laughs> these things are really absolutely incredible. Uh, so this is all a kilometer underground. There is, I believe, in Saskatchewan, something in the order of 20,000 kilometers of these mines that are going. And they have just great big fleets of trucks under there. They're just going back and forth along here. And they're just you know, pulling out huge amounts of, of the salt. What they're interested in is where the water is. And so there's a, uh, a, a survey that can be done. Uh, it's called a DC survey. We'll take that towards the end of the, uh, <coughs> of, of the course. And what you're seeing plotted up on here is the image of what a survey was like taken along one of these tunnels. And the blue indicates stuff that is quite conductive. Uh, in particular, it could be water that's got these salts in. And the red is, uh, it is, is resistant. And if we look at more at a particular section, when we look at the geophysics, data, even just from looking at the data, you see, we, as, so we're walking along a tunnel here. And actually, the experiment is done so that you're looking up, because that's where the water is going to come from, right? So you're worried about the water above you, not so much the water below you. So this is logistically a little extra challenging, because now you've got to put your sources and receivers on the ceiling. It's called the back. And you've got to do the experiment up there. And then you do, you know, you plot the data. So it's like you're looking at this data and it's kind of going up. And from your perspective, what you're interested in is where the, the blue is. And you can see right here, this is this blue is coming really close to the ceiling. It's like a meter away. And in fact, there was some water that was seeping. But again, if you're just looking at the ceiling, it's like, okay, it kind of all looks the same. So you need to have some way of looking in depth and trying to see what's happening laterally here so that uh, you can make some decisions about, okay, I'm not worried about here, I'm worried about here, and I'm uh, really worried about here. That was one survey. You can also do another survey. The the third one that you, we do here is called Ground Penetrating Radar, or GPR. Has anybody heard of GPR? One, a couple of timid hands, yes, okay. Uh, anyway, it's, it's used a lot in uh, geotechnical work and also in you know, civil engineering. And what you're seeing here, this is a section, this is horizontal in here, and this is kind of depth. Uh, again, we're kind of looking up. And you can see that there's this, you know, there's this image here. There's a reflection that's coming in, and that reflection is coming from you know, a region of Scott uh, where there's water up in there. So, different. I mean, the reason I put that up is that you know sometimes we'll actually want to look at multiple surveys to get multiple pieces of information and see if they kind of all fit together and um, make our. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, make our judgments accordingly. So to come back to our minerals exploration, I'm showing you a couple of these uh, before, but here's here's again our uh, mineral exploration problem, and we've got uh, a trans. Well, we, the Earth is going to be the transmitter in this case. We're going to measure stuff stuff out here, measure total field uh, anomaly. And what we'd really like to be able to do is to take this image here. So that, this is just a plan view map. So it tells you a lot about what might be changing horizontally, but there's no way of looking at this and extrapolating to depth. And this is the big thing that geophysics can do that complements what geology has a very difficult time doing, and that is seeing in the third dimension. So in this particular case here, we've got these data, we do this processing, the inversion, and we actually come out with this three-dimensional image of, of what's there. This image has got geologic structure to it, 
and can be extremely valuable from the point of view of understanding what you've got. So I've mentioned the word inversion a couple of times. I just want to just talk a little bit about it. Uh, we'll see it a little bit in this course, not as much as I'd like because of lack of time. But uh, it is the way in which we try to process virtually all of our different kinds of geophysical data. So how, how does the whole system work? So first of all, we've got an Earth here. Uh, we don't really know what it is. We have uh, a transmitter and a receiver. We fly it over there, and we get some data. What we really want to do is to use those data and tell us something about what's happening here. To do that process is called inversion. So that means we want to somehow take these data, do something with them, and it's computationally intensive programming to, to do this. Goes through this, and then it gives us out something out about what is uh, what the Earth is like, which a representative Earth model, and we use the word model here in many cases to kind of describe this distribution of physical properties that would have reproduced uh, the data. The process generally is as follows. So we've got some data that, that we measure, might do some pre-processing. And to actually solve this inverse problem, what we're going to do is, is we're going to make a mathematical description of the Earth. So we'll just take a volume, let's say 100 meters by 100 meters by 100 meters, and we're going to divide it up into a whole bunch of little cells, so maybe a meter by meter by meter, and we're going to adjust the physics. So in each of those cells, it's going to have a constant physical property. And then we're going to just adjust these guys so that we end up with a distribution of this susceptibility in this case that would reproduce the data and also that it's consistent with whatever prior knowledge we have. So that's the essence. The, the, the idea is that we're going to represent the Earth mathematically in some sense. It's often in 3D, but sometimes it could be 2D or maybe even if in 1D. We're going to have constant physical properties in each of the cells, adjust them so that we fit the data and whatever a priori information we have. So if that seems strange to you, uh, it shouldn't, because this is something that happens uh, on, on a very kind of regular basis. How many people have been in an accident that do go to a hospital and a CAT scan? Okay, so what happened? <laughs> What'd you do? I don't know. They told me to do things and I listened. That's how my health experience doesn't really go. Yeah, so they'll, I mean, what, what's, a, what's a CAT scan, right? It's, it, it's got a, a, a transmitter on one side, so there's a source, and it's got a receiver, right? And then you're measuring data that has gone all the way through your, your skull, and that's those are numbers, right? And then they keep turning this thing around, and then you get more numbers, right? So in the end, every time you've done this, you've got, you've got a source, you've got your thing that you're trying to image, your head, and you've got a receiver. So it's exactly the same as that geophysics. And now, in order to get this particular image here, and hold it a bit, but in order to, to get that, you know, they have to divide your head up into a whole bunch of little pixels. And in this case, you know, you want to make those pixels, you know, pretty small, right? You, like much, much less than a, than a centimeter. And then if you thought about, okay, how many pixels do you need to kind of image your head? You know, maybe you've got 100 pixels this way, 100 this way, 100 this way, 100 times 100 times 100. That's already a million parameters that you, that you have to find. And then you're going to have to do some, you know, mathematical optimization to end up with a picture like this. And you find out, oh, this guy's red here. Could be massing blood or something. You know, there, there's problems. But it's the same thing. It is exactly the same thing, except that in medical imaging, 
is sometimes a little bit easier because you can you've got such uh, good control of where you put your sources and receivers. Where on geoph geophysics, we're often like, okay, sources on the surface, receivers mm -hmm. on the surface. So it doesn't give you nearly that kind of coverage that, that you like. But it's the same thing. So when you have an inversion result, then you get to, to view it. So there being numbers that are shown uh, the end product of, of, of all this is, is that you have this big cube of, of values, and you're going to image that somehow or visualize that. And you can say, well, everything that's less than a certain value is going to be totally transparent, and everything above that's got a different color. And so you might end up with a picture that looks like that. And when you come back to this magnetic field data, that's that's sort of that's how that picture was obtained. We did the took the Earth, made it a whole bunch of cells, solved that optimization problem, had a threshold value, did an isosurface, and you get up something that looks like this. And from the point of view of interacting with geologists about this, they actually don't need to know any of that other detail. What they're really interested in is this guy. In fact, there's two things that are important to communicate between the geophysicist and a geologist or an engineer, whatever. And that is, OK, what physical property are you talking about? And how does it relate to your particular problem? And what is the final image of that physical property that you've got? That's really all that you need to need to. So I've already kind of talked about this, uh, but here is now a framework for applied geophysics, and we sometimes refer to it as the seven-step framework. Um, everything that we do in, in this course, when we have a problem, is going to kind of be tied to, to this. So this is this is what we are. The first thing uh, is called the setup. And this is actually important uh, to really be critical of, of what it is that you're asking, because here you have to define what is the question to be answered. That may seem odd that uh, I said you have to think about this. But you know, very often people are confronted. They've got some kind of a problem. Uh, you know, okay, my dam is leaking. Or there's something happening, right? Uh, so I've got a problem. I mean, so I want this problem solved. But in fact, that's not that. That's not the level of question that you, uh, is really very useful. Uh, you have to be much more detailed about. Okay, what is the piece of information or pieces of information? which if I had, that would really help me answer my problem. So that means that you need to be kind of critical about exactly what is the question that you really want to have answered. So if somebody answers that question, you've got uh, a lot better chance to help solve your problem. Okay, so that's the setup. To think very carefully about what your problem is. And then the next critical point is, okay, of those important parts of the problem, how are they associated with diagnostic physical properties? So just the same as that UXO was, you know, we kind of decided that, okay, there's some properties that are associated with that. Your challenge for any engineering or geologic problem is to take the thing that you are interested in, that you want to solve, and you have to convert that to physical properties. This is not easy, but it's the essential part that's required because geophysicists can only tell you something about physical properties. Uh, so your problem, and you might have to work with geophysicists back and forth about this a bit, is to really kind of define what are the diagnostic physical properties uh, that, that you're interested in. So that's crucial. Once you got to here, you know what the question is, and you know what the physical properties are, now it's getting pretty easy to kind of get good to go. Because once we know the physical properties, then that tells us what survey we're going to use and 
once you know what survey, then you can do some survey design and decide how you, uh, you know, how many data you want to acquire and where you want to acquire them. Then you do the data collection and the processing of those data, some kind of an interpretation. Here's where the, so we take the magnetic data, we do some processing, we get some inversion result out, we interpret that in terms of your mineral deposit or whatever. And then and an important part of this is the synthesis, where you now take the output of what you've got and decide, okay, how is it actually connected up with the initial problem that you want to have answered? So you kind of tying that thing full circle. So that's, uh, that's the goal. And we're going to try to put every problem that we encounter kind of within that, uh, within that context. So just to uh, maybe show you a, an example here, uh, it's got a couple of reasons for doing this. Uh, this was a region in northern Australia, and it was a mineral deposit. The first thing that was asked about this is, okay, what are the characteristic physical properties? And it turned out that one is conductivity. I mentioned that before. It's the ability to pass current easily. And the other is this thing called chargeability. I'll talk just a moment about, about that. But if we look at this, the uh, mineral deposit that, that we're really interested in, uh, which is copper, lead, zinc, uh, it's got a moderate conductivity, and it's got a high chargeability. So that's kind of the fingerprint of, of this, right? That's what, we're, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for places in the Earth that kind of have an intermediate conductivity, but really high chargeability. If we're going to find that, it has to be distinct from the rocks around the outside. So this is, this is an important aspect of geophysics in that we can, only, uh, we can only find something if that something is very different from its host material. If we look at the host volcanics, we see that uh, their conductivity is actually pretty low, and their chargeability is low. So that differs. And if we look at the adjacent shales, find out that, oh, those, those shales are actually very high conductivity, but they have a low chargeability. So you got a bit of a table here, and that's kind of your fingerprint thing, right? So the guy that we're looking for is this one in here, moderate conductivity and high chargeability. Okay, so conductivity, it'll be towards the end of this uh, course, but we're going to look at something called the DC resistivity survey, which is DC stands for direct current. And the experiment is one in which we take a, uh, a generator and we put one current, positive current electrode here and a negative current electrode here. So the current flows through the ground from the positive to the negative. And as it goes through the structure beneath, it kind of distorts a little bit. And we end up building up electrical charges on, on the outside. and uh, yeah, so you've got this kind of distortion. <laughs> Those charges actually give rise to voltages that we would measure up here. So that's the experiment. It's very simple, right? Take a generator, pump two current electrodes in the ground, take a voltmeter, measure a voltage, and then you've got some data that you can plot in a variety of forms. This is, this is something called a pseudo section. Again, we're going to come back to these things. This is horizontal distance along here. And this is not really depth, but it's kind of like a pseudo depth. And it depends upon how far apart the currents and potentials are. And, and what you see here is that there's some regions red. So that's, uh, th those are kind of high conductivity regions. Or, and then there's some regions in blue that are much more resistant. But it's pretty hard in looking at that to tell very much about, you know, the actual structure of, of what's in there. So we go back to the uh, the example in, in Australia. Uh, 
Uh, so here's here's the region. So it's about four kilometers in this direction and about two and a half kilometers here. So it's it's a pretty big size. And then there's ten lines of data that were acquired. We look like this, and each line of data gives rise to a data signature that looks like this. And in this particular case uh, here, there's a current electrode here, and we're measuring the potentials along this way. And, and what we notice that there's all this red stuff over here, uh, which is actually indicating it's very conductive. And so you, you, know, you look at the data, and you're like, OK, yeah, there's something happening here. But just the same as in the medical imaging, where you, you'd want it to have the sources be in multiple locations. Uh, oops. Similarly here, we want to illuminate the Earth differently by now putting the current source in this side and measuring the potentials here. Now you get a different set of images. So what do we have? We've got you know, 10 lines of data. And every time we change where the current is, we get a different image. So again, something's happening. But honestly, trying to unravel what's happening inside the Earth from these images kind of drive you bonkers. So you, there's only one Earth. So there's only one Earth out there. But you just got all of these kind of different images about what the Earth is, what the data are. So after we do the uh, inversion, uh, and no cell phones or texting or anything, please. OK. Uh, so we do the inversion, and we've got this three-dimensional cube of, of numbers. And so we can now we can now view this. So what we're doing is taking this cube, and we're slicing through it. So we're going south to, to north. And you can see there's this red part that's coming up in here, blue. So there's something big happening there. And now we're going to just view it from the top down. And you notice that there's great, this great big red thing that's going up there. Now we're going to continue to rotate this, and as it's rotating, the value of the isosurface progressively increases so that in the end, we're only going to be left with the most conductive parts. And we end up with something that looks like this. From the point of view of geology, this is great. You didn't see this thing on the surface. But this is a great big black shale unit. It's a huge conductor down there. And you know, we've outlined where it is, what its depth is, and nicely located. So that's the good news. The bad news is that that's the big conductor, and it's really not of any particular use from the point of view of the mineral deposit. So it's told us some information, but not quite what we want. So remember I talked about chargeability? In a DC resistivity experiment, we put in a current source that looks like this. If the Earth is chargeable, what happens is that the voltage that you measure immediately rises and then continues to rise. And then if you turn that current off, it falls, and then it kind of decays. But what's happening here is that the Earth is actually acting like a capacitor. So as current is going through, charges are being built up. And when you turn the current off, those charges decay. So we can actually measure that. And that exact, that's exactly what a, uh, a chargeability, uh, or sometimes it's called IP, uh, experiment looks like. And we could measure those things as we do the DC resistivity experiment. Here's your sort of same types of pseudo sections. Yes. Again, they're not very informative just by themselves. But if you go ahead and you invert them in the same way that we did the DC resistivity, this is what you get. So this is now 
the N chargeability model. And you can see it's got a couple of big major regions. One is in like this, and importantly, you've got this one over here. This chargeability lies up over here, and it actually does coincide with a region of moderate conductivity. So this is the guy that you're really looking for. So two experiments, two physical properties, you put them together, work with them, get three-dimensional images, and you can make a uh, important stride on your exploration problem. So I, I think this hopefully kind of gives you a, a, a good idea about maybe what the overall picture is and, and how all of this is, is going to work. So first of all, when we talk about geophysics, it's, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, we're going to need to you know, have the mathematics, the physics, computer science, geology, engineering. Everybody's kind of got to be able to communicate. But that communication from most of our purposes really requires that we understand things in terms of physical properties and images. And as we kind of work through this course, we're, we're, we're going to be kind of working in teams and you can see that you know, there'll be there this ability to, to communicate, but our, our tools are always uh, all this in here, and then we're also going to put everything within the context of our seventh step process. So, your task for the weekend, since the rest of your courses are just kind of lolly dobbling around, we just we want to kind of fill in the gap, right? We're going to front end load this course. And actually, people like this, right? Because most courses start off. You know, kind of easy, 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 and then as you get, as you approach December, right, then it's like, oh my god, we've got all this stuff to do, there's this massive amount of, you know, projects and stuff, and, and everything kind of piles up, and it's kind of, it's like a, a tsunami that way, right? We're going the other way. We're, we're, we're starting off, the tsunami comes on the weekend, while you're, don't have anything else to do, and uh, we'll, you know, front end load you, and then, it'll be easier kind of going into the back end. So this is to uh, keep your mind uh, busy. Uh, there's a paper, it's, uh, you can get it off of the, uh, uh, off of the schedule. It's called A Geophysical Journey Around Ireland. It's a great paper. It's a great paper for many reasons. It's got the application, I believe it's like seven different types of geophysical surveys. There's this guy that's going around Ireland. He's looking at one place. He's looking for peat moss. In the other case, he's looking for the till layer in the center of Dublin. In another case, he's looking for a mineral deposit. In another case, he's looking for a karst cavity. Different problems that I think you relate to. And it's all kind of going around. And what he does is kind of show you an example of how geophysics would work in, in each of these cases. So it's not in really in-depth, stuff is kind of once over lightly, but there's all of these examples for geophysics. So what I want you to do is to read that paper, and then you're going to select one of those uh, examples out of the seven, and you're going to try to decipher the seven steps. Try to figure out, okay, what was the problem? What was the physical property? And just try to put that within the context of the set of steps. What you'll find when you do this is that there's a whole host of words and you have no idea what's going on. Like, it's just, a, there's all kinds of things that you do not, you will not have ever seen before. And I really don't expect you to understand everything this time around. But you will be able to get enough so that you'll be able to do this seven-step procedure. And then in the teams, so I, you need to read all of them, because uh, in the teams, yeah, each team is going to select one of these and then do them themselves within the seven-step process. Not only does this introduce uh, you know, a lot of the background and the thought and, and, and the jargon that's required in this course, 
We're going to use this as, as, as a hook throughout the entire course so that each of the case histories that's presented in here whenever we do a survey is actually going to be redone. And then at the end of the year, and I think this is one of my favorite times, is that on the second to last lecture, we actually go through this thing again. And it's amazing as to how much everybody has learned during that time. So we use it as a, as a barometer. We do it right at the very first, and we do it right at the end. And then by the time you see it at the end, you say, oh, yeah, man, that's so easy. Of course, we do that, right? And that's a real good sign. Then you can like say, OK, yeah, actually, I did work on that. So we're going to do that. Uh, there's also a quiz. It's not a very big quiz. It's 10 little multiple choice questions. But it's, again, just to kind of get you going with the jargon and with how geophysics works and just sort of really high level kind of non-technical stuff. But you could read the foundations in, in the GPG and then you'll do the quiz on Monday yourselves. So there's a, a little, you know, the, you answer the 10 questions. And then you're also going to do the 10 questions as a team, this will be part of your team thing. And then, of course, uh, yeah. well, it's, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's a bit rewarding, too, because it's all done as a scratch and win. And so as a team, OK, you're going to get four points if you scratch the correct answer on your first try. Uh, if you miss the first try and get it on the second try, you're going to get two points. But you're as a team, you can compete. And, you know, best team gets a chocolate bar at the end, whatever. Uh, anyway, so you get a chance, get a chance to work as a team. So that's it. So, so there's a lot, of, and then on Monday we also have lab. Okay, so Monday you have class, you have quiz, you got teammates learning, and you got lab. Monday. Okay, that's. Uh, that's it. Yeah, questions? Oh, good. Yeah.